Miniature Wargaming is a sea full of treasures and unique objects to explore. And it was calling me in, so I took the plunge. I stumbled upon skirmish games. The low model count seemed enticing to paint and play, allowing me to focus on one miniature instead of a squad for an army. After playing some Warhammer 40k Kill Team, 2018 edition, I branched off into other games, such as Malifaux, Star Wars Legion, and Infinity. After visiting my local game store one fateful Saturday, I discovered Guild Ball. Steampunk Fantasy Soccer. That's football for all of you that aren't in Burgerland. With dynamic metal sculpts. I had seen Maniac play it on his Kill Your Friends Battle Report series a few times. I loved building metal miniatures, thanks to CB and Infinity. So I dove right in and picked up a starter kit for the Butcher's Guild. And after asking around at the game store, no one really seemed to play it. In fact, they misordered these miniatures for somebody else, so they put them out to sell 25% off. Looking around my state's Facebook gaming group, I got no responses either. Soon, I got curious. How could a game made by Steamforge, who makes such juggernaut games such as Dark Souls, Monster Hunter, and D&D Epic Encounter, board games of course, have no players for a game they make? What happened to this? What led up to this point? Upon looking into Guild Ball on YouTube, I found a video called Guild Ball Has Ended, Post-Mortem Initial Thoughts by Play It Painted. This is a great video and I recommend you check it out. It'll be in the description. But this generally covered the community reaction to the news and hinted at reasons why it ended. But nothing seemed conclusive. Since many games with hyper-competitive communities still exist, this caused me to dig deeper into the rabbit hole. And what I discovered is a tale of community strength misfired corporate decisions, and one of the best board game sports games I've ever played. Born on March 22nd, 2014, Guild Ball was backed and born on Kickstarter, where many miniature games are funded now, mostly with hot debate on whether or not it's worth it, but that's another video entirely. With the easy free rules and paper dolls to print out and try for free to use, Guild Ball shook up the miniature gaming scene at the time with a rule set that was tight and competitive and focusing on that really set them apart early on. Playing well and using a faction strength was more important than rolling sixes or just getting lucky. Soon, Guild Ball started rolling out its seasons for competitive play, which is now being adopted by many other games and companies. See Warhammer 40k kills a Nachman here. The game progressed on. And with the release of new PVC miniatures, similar to the ones released in the Dark Souls board game, this would create a new era of Guild Ball with extreme growth and easy access for anybody wanting to try out the game. All this information is going to be coming from a Steamforge Games article that was deleted about why Guild Ball had ended. Flash forward six years to August 10th, 2020. Editor's note, if you're hearing this, I fucked up. On August 10th, it was announced Guild Ball was ending on September, about the 20th, I think, Guild Ball would officially end and you could no longer buy anything from their web store. Get it? Got it? Good. And Guild Ball has ended, much to the dismay of its insanely dedicated community. Rich and Matt, the game founders, touched on exactly why this unique and homegrown IP was going away. The two got on to talk about creating a tight, well-balanced rule system and, quote, flat out nailing the rules. That might come back to bite them later, but we'll get to that. In a be careful what you wish for situation, their rules may have been too refined, causing the competitive scene to explode and grow at an alarming rate. All great things for a miniatures game company, but this would be seen as an unforeseen consequence by the company. Casual new players were seemingly left in the dark, getting stomped by people who have been playing since launch. Think of it like unregulated CSGO matchmaking, or current TF2 lobbies without all the bots. Rich and Matt explained that this ended up severely harming the player base and creating a massive divide between the two player types, casual and competitive, noob and pro. Guild Ball became a game where you'd win your first game and lose your next 100. Sort of like third edition Infinity, if you know what that is. The fun elements began to fade away in favor of sleek, refined, and tuned up rules. 
This caused teams to become tiered, which most of you would assume is pretty common with some. And it would be tiered from best to worst. And Rich and Matt talk about how either teams would be trash or OP AF from the community. I gotta say, it's kind of funny that the devs are even talking about this. In the article, it seems like they don't really know what that means, or they're kind of surprised at what a tier list is. But uh, let's get back to the video. They were clearly frustrated with how the game was turning out. This wasn't their soccer with axes elevator pitch that they had imagined. This is completely understandable, and I've seen what happens when games shift focus from having fun with a rule set versus winning with a rule set. In no way am I implying that this game was not fun to play. You could definitely still play a casual game of Guild Ball and sip some beers with your pals. But going to a shop or a local league for Guild Ball is different. It attracts all types of players, which can lead to this big meta competitive chasing issue that the developers are talking about. New players picking up the game weren't really finding it very football -y. The team were also worried about SKU sales creep and the game collapsing under its own weight due to its miniature bloat. We'll get to that later too. Maybe it was best for the team to end the game there, where the bloated rule set leaving them with a choice to rewrite the rules or abandon the game entirely. They do express revisiting the setting in the future, the setting of the Free Cities. And on September 1st, 2020, Guild Ball will finally come to an end. No more axes, no more online store, no more funny mascot friends, and most importantly, no more ox. Seems pretty punctual and makes sense, right? Well, if you ask the community of Guild Ball, there's another story to this. And before we go any further, guys, I want to give a massive shout out to the team over at the Guild Ball Community Project, working to keep the game alive through a new community of rules and unreleased guilds. With that in mind, this is all hypothetical and theory based off of a myriad of different things that have been shown, speculated, or pulled from the store. This is one of the largest sources I could find, and still, it is very speculative, but we could draw conclusions from the speculation that we did have. I got all my information from there, and they're a bunch of very friendly people who love to play Guild Ball. Upon asking the current Guild Ball community about what happened to the game, I was met with a flurry of different reasons why, similar to the rest of the research that I found, but this time with more meat. Some of them linked to this article that I previously talked about, others linking and citing different sources, especially one from Spiky Bits, and others saying that the game was just too bloated to really play, and it's been around for too long. So, let's get into those reasons now, shall we? Okay, let's start with Theory 1. Steamforge Games just had a ton of other successful projects. They have a wide variety of games with an excellent range of miniatures. Visiting their website now, you will find a plethora of licensed games, third-party IP board games to play. Like the aforementioned Dark Souls board game. They make board games for things like Horizon Zero Dawn, RuneScape, Pac-Man, and Peaky Blinders? Okay, so maybe they just make board games for only third-party games anymore. They don't really have any unique IPs, which is fine. But it's strange that Guild Ball has stuck around in a totally unique world with all of this lore that they've created over the six-year cycle. And it's a small island in a sea of pop culture of plastic and cardboard board games. Obviously. Steamforge isn't like Games Workshop, with its monolithic status and too-big-to-fail mentality. But it's also not like Corvus Belly, who makes Infinity, and many of the other board games are set within that universe. Instead, they're somewhere in the middle. They seem to really enjoy money, and of course that makes sense because it's a business and that's what they need, but as the community of Guild Ball would learn, the more third-party IP games that they would create, the less that the company would really put forth towards Guild Ball which makes sense because that's where the money is. They would learn that they're a small totem pole in the company's roster. Bigger budget IPs were generating way more money than Guild Ball, so all of the resources really just kind of went to there, including some of the sculptors, like a gentleman named Russ, who did, by and large, most of the sculpts for Guild Ball. So, Steamforge would shift focus to making these board games more tight, and making sure they sell well and release on time. And there's nothing wrong with going completely third party. I mean, hell, it's all LEGO does nowadays, and they're turning out great. No, I'm not sore about all of those canceled LEGO IPs. Anyway, the community was feeling neglected, like their voices were not heard. 
And after rereading the goodbye post from Rich and Matt, it kind of feels like they were dragging the community through the mud, upset at how the game had evolved and how the community had played it. Well, parts of it feel like they're directly calling out parts of the community with their trash tier and OP tier comments. Later sales figures would reflect that their new audience for board games were essentially fans of those IPs. Fans of Horizon Zero Dawn, Dark Souls, and Resident Evil that also like to play board games. It's a total shift in the market, and this happens all the time. There's nothing to really be upset at, it's just how business happens sometimes, and it is what it is. So, those are two theories about what happened to Guild Ball. Next, we'll explore the logistical side, including profits and materials, by Steamforge Games, aka SFG. Speaking of profits and new concepts, let's talk about metal and plastic miniatures. Metal miniatures used to be made from lead, until people began to get sick from acute lead poisoning and it was proved that lead was in fact toxic, so that was reserved for paint instead, because that makes sense. So they shifted into a material called white metal, which as of recording in the year of 2022 on March, is very expensive to produce. Corvus Belli, the creator of some of the best metal miniatures on the market right now, have voiced their feelings and frustrations about how expensive the material is getting to produce, leading them to cast newer, big miniatures in plastic. Two mixed results. I mean, I think that bear looks pretty cool, but some people are a little upset about it. Plastic miniatures, on the other hand, can be cheap to make and look very good. CGW for proof. In the case of SFG, they shifted from metal miniatures to PVC plastic around 2017 with the launch of the Farmer's Guild. Each team pack would include five players, a mascot, a ball, a goal, and a piece of terrain relevant to the faction. So how would these turn out for SFG? Well, we're going to get into that because it is another reason why Guild Ball may have ended. Bad prints of miniatures go way back to the early times of the hobby when you would get large lumps of resin miniatures that were poorly sculpted with bubbles or maybe you needed to get some gap filler. The most popular of these would be the abomination that is Citadel Finecast, everybody's favorite topic to shit on. Warhammer resin miniatures filled with bubbles and horrible mold lines on resin sprues of all things. Forge World doesn't even do that. They were so bad. In the early 2000s, Games Workshop would offer to replace any bad prints with the new ones, with no bubbles or anything similar to this. Most rumors say this is just Games Workshop reusing the metal molds and putting resin through them, but this remains to be seen. SFG's Guild Ball Miniatures range would extend into a myriad of different materials, such as PVC and metal. The first ones were created with metal, aforementioned. And you could also order strange gray resin figures directly from SFG. This was most likely test prints from their 3D prints or at the launch when they were experimenting with different types of material. This would remain this way until the Farmer's Guild came out around mid-2017. The Farmer's Guild was printed alongside the Blacksmiths in an early example of the new PVC technology that we saw in the Dark Souls board game. After these two guilds, we would see a few minor guilds cast into PVC, including the Cooks, the Rat Catchers, and the Navigators. Soon after we saw the Farmer's Guild release, along with a few other smaller guilds, we saw Kickoff, which was a new starter box with PVC miniatures that launched. This brought the Brewers and the Masons into the PVC family, and they were all initially met and made with the solid response for the community. Some of them complained about a lack of very fine detail, but from what I've gathered from a few other sculptors and designers of miniatures, it seems that Steamforge used the principle of detail on a 2D plane, so the front and the back of the miniatures look incredibly detailed, with the sides looking somewhat detailed. However, to sacrifice this, we saw different poses that were a lot more static versus the very energetic, sprinting soccer poses that were kind of affiliated with the game very early on. To most of the player base, this was okay, as no assembly was required for most of these miniatures, meaning you could buy a guild and play right out of the box, cards included. Following these releases, SFG began to preview and show off some new sculpts for the Fishermen's, Morticians, Hunters, and Butcher's Guild, who would be released in a type of colored resin, unlike the PVC miniatures from earlier. 
This is where the timeline gets a little tricky. After confirming with a few sources and finalizing what happened and when it happened, I think I can confidently present the facts of when Guild Ball went from metal to PVC to resin. And yes, we're going into resin versus PVC. I don't personally know why, if I had to make a guess for why they went to resin for these four guilds, I would say is either money or they wanted to make the sculpts more dynamic, which once you see the sculpts, I think that might be a little divine. From what I've been told by the Guild Ball community, that there was some kind of lapse in leadership or quality control with these miniatures and they got printed in a very brittle resin. Or in some cases with some of the miniatures, I believe it was the Fisherman's Guild, there was a sculpt that was included that was not the approved final designed sculpt of the character that was ended up shipping off for people to get, meaning that they did not kind of proofread or check the quality of their product at all. This led SFG to ship all of the pre-orders of the first guild made in resin, the Fisherman's Guild, and to cancel the rest at least for a little bit, leading to the Blue Resin Fisherman's Guild to be one of the rarest set of GB miniatures. Steamforge also canceled the contract with their resin company, leading to something called the Long Wait, which has been dubbed by the community. With no company to supply these miniatures for some of the guilds, and Steamforge selling off many of the metal miniatures and starter boxes a few years back or a few months back with the release of PVC miniatures, this led for anyone wanting to play some of the guilds such as the Fishermen's, Morticians, and Butcher's Guild to rely on sites like eBay and secondhand trading for metal miniatures. By the time Steamforge had found a second supplier for these miniatures, it would be about a month or two before the game was gone for good. After that, Guild Ball was pretty much over, and Steamforge would stop supporting the game. After exploring the various reasons for Guild Ball's downfall, I think the game was indeed bloated and could not have possibly collapsed under its own weight very soon. The decision to end it was regarded as a no-brainer and something that needed to be done according to the community. However, I believe that Steamforge did somewhat not cultivate the community enough. I know that they did kind of over update the game too much without changing things and making things balanced rather just updating things because they needed content to be pushed out and i know i keep bringing up games like infinity but guild ball has a somewhat similar amount of stuff with infinity with the term of activations and its origins as well as the material it was made in and the hyper competitive aspect but corvus belly the company that makes infinity regular shakes things up for players for their new edition n4 whether that be a free bounty hunter to take or a biker instead. I wish Steamforge did kind of care a little bit more about Guild Ball to placate the masses of the game, to make it feel more casual and competitive. However, this might not have been enough. Pointing back to Rich and Matt's post, it seemed like the game was suffering from a lot of rules bloat, and they didn't have the time, means, or resources, or all three, to really spend on fixing this game. Instead, they decided to cut the ship loose and let it sail out in the sea. So, whatever the reason, whether it be monetary, community, or officially, Guild Ball was a quick-growing competitive miniatures game with fun skirmish rules that rewarded great plays and great players. While the game may have officially ended, the community did not accept its end. Instead, they picked up the remnants of Guild Ball, patched it back together, and still play it to this day in that Guild Ball community server that I mentioned. The game is alive and well there with dedicated members, memes, and players. There are relaxed, knowledgeable players eager to help new players such as myself. I've only played a total of three games of Guild Ball so far, and the community is nothing but passionate for the game. They're even working on updated cards for a new community season and releasing a new guild which was set to release by Steamforge called the Lamplighters Guild and they have the STLs ready for print right now, and I think they should be releasing by the end of April, but we'll see. Guild Ball may have officially been discontinued by the company, but the spirit and core of the game are alive and well thanks to the dedicated members of the community. Thanks for watching, and I think that's what happened to Guild Ball. Whoa, you're still here? That's kind of weird. But you should subscribe, hit that like button, share the video around your friends, Maybe check out some of my other videos. If you have a board game or something that you wonder what really happened to it, just let me know in the comments. 
I'm thinking about doing a Dystopian Wars video, or one on Heroescape, depending on how this does. Thanks for watching, you guys are the best.